This video is the follow-up to the 11 worst presidents video I made in mid-July of this year. If you haven't already seen that video, I ask that you go do so. It would very much help me and the channel. Today I'll be ranking the 10 best presidents, in my opinion. These presidents are George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Monroe, Abe Lincoln, James Garfield, Teddy Roosevelt, Calvin Coolidge, FDR, Harry Truman, and most recently, Dwight Eisenhower. The way that we'll be scoring these presidents is fairly simple, basically just the reverse of how I rank the worst presidents, scoring them off of popularity in their time, popularity in our time, personal qualities and accomplishments, or how much of a role model they are, professional achievements and successes, delivering on campaign promises and crisis management, lasting impact, or how long their achievements and influence in office lasted after they left, how well they unified the people, political capital, electoral success, or how large of margins they won their office by, winning wars and foreign policy success, experience, relations with Congress, and vision setting. Each of these 10 presidents will be scored on a scale of 1 to 10 on whether they did these things, how well they did them, and so on. The president having the highest score will be considered, by this channel standards at least, the best president of them all. So now, in no particular order, let's rank the 10 best presidents. FDR is one of the three most popular and important presidents of all time. He is many people's favorite president, and that's for good reason. In his time, he put an end to the Great Depression with the New Deal, wanted the US to enter World War II, and when we did, we liberated Europe and put a fairly quick end to the fascist regimes in Italy and Germany, along with a number of other great accomplishments. He won his first term in 1932 over Herbert Hoover during the worst of the Depression by a margin of nearly 60% of the popular vote and 89% of the electoral vote. He then went on to win a second term, but then he did something never seen before. He ran and won for a third term, and then a fourth term. He died just a few months into his fourth term though, but in every election he had won the popular vote by over 53% and the electoral vote by over 80. This puts his popularity during his time with about a score of 6.3 and an electoral success score of about 8.3. Historians now give him a much higher approval rating of about 85%. He won his second term by a larger margin than he won his first term because of his good handling of the Depression and his vision setting, and his ability to deal with Congress, which in part came from his political capital. This gives him an overall professional achievement score of an 8.5, vision setting score of an 8, political capital score of 7, and a Congressional Relations score of 8. However, Franklin wasn't quite as much of a personal role model. He cheated on his wife, Eleanor, and after she found out about this, the two basically just had a professional relationship. So that Franklin wouldn't have to go through divorce, which at the time would have resulted in the practical death of his political career, and Eleanor's political influence would die with it. When he did die in 1945, his wife wasn't by his side. She was back in D.C., but his mistress was. Overall, though, he was a good, decent man, and so I'll give him a 5.5 on personal quality, so low because of his unfaithfulness, as well as the internment camps he made, which were just terrible. I mean, I don't feel that's a very controversial statement. He was the one who signed the executive order to set up these camps, which were practical concentration camps just without the mass organized murder of their German counterparts. This was despicable, and it's an unfortunate and embarrassing mark on FDR's otherwise great legacy. Overall though, FDR had a great presidency. Economic success, a booming economy, which would last decades after his presidency, FDR also helped us win the world war, and after he died and we won it in fact, America had a level of prestige and influence and respect which had never been seen before or since. I'd say FDR has a lasting impact score of about an 8. The only real bit of his policy which wasn't already fulfilled or 
had been fulfilled after his death was stable relations with the USSR coming out of the war. This gives FDR a total of 93.1 out of 120, or 77.5%. Monroe was the last founding father president. He, like almost every president before him besides John Adams, was from Virginia. He was a farmer, he was a plantation owner, and he was a slave owner. Given that he was around in the days before modern approval polls like we have for presidents nowadays, it's hard to give him a real popularity score. But he won both of his elections by 68 and 80% of the popular vote respectively, and so I'll guess that he had a roughly 70 or 75% approval overall. Nowadays, historians give him a slightly lower 65%. Monroe had an overall boring presidency, but that's a good thing. His time was known as the era of good feelings, a time of prosperity, peace, and all around, well, good feelings. This didn't last long though, after the election of 1824 in which John Quincy Adams, Andrew Jackson, as well as a couple of other smaller candidates fought for the presidency, Jackson won the popular vote. But there was no clear winner in the Electoral College, and so Congress decided the winner, and they picked Adams. This was an unpopular decision, and the nation almost immediately left the era of good feelings and fell into a different era of turmoil and division. His legacy, in this regard, did not last. But another piece of his legacy, the Monroe Doctrine, did. This doctrine said that the U.S. would not interfere in wars outside of the Americas and would fight European influence in the Americas. This wasn't violated until nearly 100 years later, in 1917, when Woodrow Wilson dragged us into World War I. So he gets a 5 on lasting impact, an 8 on popular foreign policy, 7 on relations with Congress and political capital, 9 on electoral success, and a 7 on vision setting. Monroe came to office with plenty of experience, having been a Secretary of State in War, Governor of Virginia, Minister to England and France, Senator, and a Congressman. He was a nearly great president. Most of his accomplishments were foreign policy related, mostly being treaties or how he annexed Florida and created the Monroe Doctrine. Yet he didn't avoid or ignore home ground issues. He was an all around unifying and popular president, as shown by his huge margins of victory in both of his elections. I think he was an all around good man too. I'll give him a 5. 4 points subtracted because of his slaveholding on personal qualities, and a 6 on professional achievements, and a 7 on ability to unify. This gives Monroe 82.75 out of 120, which is about 69%. This one is a bit more unconventional. Most historians wouldn't rank James Garfield in the top 10 list for the same reasons they wouldn't put William Henry Harrison on a bottom 10 list, because both of them died very early into their terms. Garfield was shot just seven months into his first term, but he was a very promising man, especially when he was in an office like the presidency. He was elected after Rutherford Hayes, Republican, decided not to run for a second term, as he promised when first campaigning. So, in a very surprising nominating convention, James Garfield became the presidential candidate in 1880. He won the election narrowly over his Democratic rival, with over 58 of the electoral vote, but only 48% of the popular vote. He ran on a platform of civil service reform to eliminate corruption in the government and hold our public servants to higher standards. He would have gotten this platform through Congress if it hadn't been for the powerful New York machine, controlled by Roscoe Conklin. When Garfield died, something unexpected happened. His vice president, Chet Arthur, who had before just been a cog in the machine politics, he had been the right-hand man of Roscoe Conklin, was now beginning to grasp the full responsibilities of the presidency as only a man who was reluctantly about to take the reins of government could, and overcame the machine. This took remarkable courage on Chet's part, and probably nobody could have predicted that he would have been able to do it. This cemented, if only briefly, Garfield's platform on civil service reform, but it, like Garfield, would soon be forgotten. So Garfield gets a four on delivering on campaign promises for he had so little time to deliver on them, 
three on lasting impact, six on capital, four on foreign policies and relations with Congress, and a six on vision setting. In a funny way, it was his death that united the country. Just four years earlier in 1876, watch this video to learn more about it, the country threatened disunion. And a little over 10 years before that, we were in a bloody and brutal civil war. But now, uniting over the tragic death of their new and young president, we became reunited, if only briefly. Garfield was a good man. He was our last civil war president. Unfortunately, once, and only once, he cheated on his wife. But when he came home to his wife, he confessed everything and never cheated again. He made a mistake and he learned from it and grew for it, which is all anyone could ever really ask for. Now, historians still rank him around 55% positive, for he is mostly forgotten and his presidency was so tragically short, it's hard to rank him fairly. If he had not been killed by a desperate man as he had been, he would have been a great president, a truly great president. So he gets a 5.5 on modern popularity, 8 on personal qualities, 9 on unifying the country, and a 7 on experience. This makes Garfield's total score 67.3 out of 120, or 56%. Dwight Eisenhower was the hero of World War II, never having served in any publicly elected office before, but he had a long life in the military. During the war, he was put in charge of all of the Allied armies in Europe. He commanded D-Day and marched to Berlin, helping force the Germans' eventual surrender. Many wanted him to run in the 1948 election against Harry Truman, but he was good enough and loyal enough to Truman as president that he would. During all of his career before the presidency, he made sure not to involve himself in politics. So when entering the race in 1952, many were surprised that he was a Republican. To great generals, after a war is done, the presidency is practically guaranteed. This is what happened with General Grant in 1868 and George Washington in 1788. Even Zachary Taylor of the Mexican-American War got the presidency because he was a great general, not to mention Andrew Jackson. After World War II was over, it was a certain thing that one of the great generals, whether it be Patton, Eisenhower, or MacArthur, would get the presidency. They were all heroes of the war, and at least immediately after the war was over, they were all loved, almost universally, by Americans. During his time, he had an average approval rating of 65%. Today, he is even more popular, with about 75%. Ike, being the post-war former general and now president, was a very unifying figure. And though he could have easily used and given some sort of genuine credibility to McCarthyism, he didn't. And though he resisted communist influence, he wouldn't just out and call his political opponents communists, even though that would have been a popular strategy and done him much good politically. He won both of his elections by over 86% of the popular vote. And though he had a relatively weak vision, or rather, he hardly had one at all, he had plenty of political capital and so had very good relations with Congress and so was able to get most of his and the Republicans' otherwise agenda through Congress. One of his greatest accomplishments in office was the Eisenhower Highway, connecting one end of the country to the other. Also, his personal courage was also very admirable. And though he sometimes failed in this, he would most always put what he knew was right before what was politically convenient. This, I think, was best shown in his integration of the Little Rock High School and shoving in the National Guard to overpower the segregationist governor of Arkansas and his orders. Otherwise, he was all around admirable too. I think he was a good man and a good president. His actions as president lasted long after his term ended. His actions in the Little Rock Crisis, particularly, supported civil rights and asserted the president's authority over state governments and also helped the civil rights cause. His highway system is still used every day by millions of Americans. Overall, I'd say, besides a few, Eisenhower is probably one of the presidents whose actions and effects thereof 
have lasted the longest and in an overall positive way. This gives the Eisenhower an 81 out of 120, or 67.5%. Thomas Jefferson was probably one of the smartest men ever to have been president. I mean, he was just a genius from his creation of the Declaration of Independence to any of his thousands of hobbies, like planting, farming, uh, geography, natural sciences, architecture, bird keeping, mathematics, and the list goes on. He was a renaissance man if there ever was one. His time was one before popular vote was even recorded, and so I only really have electoral vote to go off of. So we'll just say popularity in his time was around 60%. Jefferson won both of his elections by around 52 and 92% respectively in the Electoral College, so we'll cut that even and say around 70%. Historians today have a generally positive opinion, giving him 70%. This popularity was well earned. He made an amazing deal with the French to buy the Louisiana Territory, he, quote, slashed army and navy expenditures, cut the budget, eliminated the tax on whiskey, so unpopular in the West, yet reduced the national debt by a third, unquote, all while standing up to the Barbary pirates in the Mediterranean, who were stealing from American sailors. Beyond his professional achievements, he had many personal achievements, as described a bit earlier. So I'll give him an 8 on professional success, a 6 on lasting impact, a 7 on unity, but a 5 on his role model score with a number of points subtracted for his slave owning. The reason his professional achievement score was so high was his relations with Congress. I mean, he had been in politics so long, serving as an ambassador to France, Secretary of State, Vice President, as well as a number of local and statewide offices in Virginia, that he was already a national figure before the nation was even founded. This gives Jefferson 78.5 out of 120, or 65.4%. Roosevelt became president after the assassination of William McKinley, and unlike a lot of other accidental presidents, instead of just promising to basically act like McKinley would have in his decision making, Roosevelt said that he'd behave just as if he, and not McKinley, had been the one elected in the first place. This normally would have been a bad idea, but Roosevelt's use of the bully pulpit, or basically just cooperating and setting terms with the press from the get-go, made him very popular, with about 65% popularity then, and about 75% now. He is one of the most iconic presidents ever, and a role model all around, with his per perseverance, integrity, honesty, uh, industry. I mean, he was a magnetic person and in his time, and... As time passed, he has only become more and more magnetic, so he gets a 6.5 in popularity in his time, 7.5 in our time, and an 8 on how much of a role model he is. Personal successes aside, he had many professional successes too. His handling of the coal strike, which I plan to make a video on, as well as his role in creating the modern national parks, trust busting, and so on are all incredibly impressive. He practically single-handedly engineered modern politics, for better or for worse, with his whistle-stop tour campaign in 1903, as well as his use of the bully pulpit which I mentioned just a bit ago. He won the 1904 election with over 70% of the electoral vote, which won him a good deal of political capital and so too his relations with Congress were very, fairly good. This gives him a professional successes score of 8. And for lasting impact, electoral success, political capital, and congressional relations, all of seven. For all of his professional successes, though, he was still fairly divisive. Though, that wasn't necessarily his own fault and more the fault of political bosses, like the ones on Tammany Hall, or others all across the country who feared his calls for and powers to effect reform. So he gets a five on unifying ability, and for both experience and foreign policy success, I'll give him an 8. So his total score is an even 84 out of 120, or 70%. This is the second highest score so far, just behind his little cousin, Franklin Roosevelt. Coolidge is one of my personal favorites, though he's a bit unconventional to be on most people's favorite presidents list. Coolidge took over after the death of Warren Harding. And if you want to learn more about Coolidge's ascension, you should watch the video I made for it. 
And a little under a year later, he won the 1924 election with 54% of the popular vote and over 70% of the electoral vote. This was the Roaring Twenties, an era of general freedom, expression, and economic boom. And when he decided not to run in 1928, many people were disappointed, but regardless, he left office as one of the most popular presidents ever. However, behind all of the prosperity of the 20s was lurking economic disaster, which would come under Coolidge's successor, Herbert Hoover. Hoover got most of the blame, but so did Coolidge and the Republican Party at large, and so he is now seen less favorably with about a 55% approval today, in contrast with the some 65 or even 70% popularity back then. As these things go, Coolidge's easy election win got him plenty of political capital. He spent that capital as his term went on and was able to deliver on many campaign promises and had generally good relations with Congress. Coolidge, all in all, was a good man. He's considered a pretty boring man and president, and that's partly because that's how he presented himself, and more or less, he was fairly boring, at least when he has presidents like Teddy Roosevelt or Lincoln or any of these other great presidents to compete with. In many ways, I consider him a personal role model, though, and I'm sure that at least a few others feel the same. This makes it for a total of 77 points out of 120 total, which is 64%. Washington was our first ever president, and is typically ranked in the top three presidents ever, and is, to this day, many people's favorite president. For good reason, too. He single-handedly crafted the presidency, created the two-term president which only FDR ever broke, and laid the foundation for a union and a democracy unbroken still. He was born to a relatively well-off family, rose through the ranks of the then British and then afterwards Revolutionary American Army, was president of the Constitutional Convention, serving also in a number of other positions. He was elected president with 100% of the electoral vote, and probably a similar number in the popular vote given he was the only real candidate in either of his elections. Still, he was abused by the press, probably more than a lot of other presidents, save a few, and that somewhat deteriorated his relations with Congress, though not very much, so I'll give him an 8 on relations with Congress, capital, and a 9 for professional achievements. All in all, he was a great general, a great president, and a great man, and probably the best person we could have possibly had to form our young nation. Still, like many of our early presidents, he was a slave owner. He had enlightened views of slavery, but to put it as Tim McGrath put it in his biography of James Monroe, quote, but, and it will always be but when discussing slaveholding presidents, the president's worldview of slavery stopped at his property line, end quote. Slavery is a truly disappointing and above all tragic blotch on the legacy of many of our early presidents, and so I'll do to Washington what I did to Monroe and Jefferson, and I'll subtract points off of his role model score for this blotch. And so Washington gets 100 out of the possible 120, which is 83.3%, the highest yet. Now for my personal favorite president, Harry S. Truman. Truman took office when FDR died in the last months of the World War. FDR died just a few months into his fourth term, and though most everybody knew he wasn't exactly in his prime at the time, very few thought that he was going to die so soon. Truman never really sought out the Senate in the first place. He actually tried to avoid at nearly all costs becoming vice president, and his rise was probably one of the most surprising and unexpected things to have ever have happened in modern American politics. I wouldn't call him inexperienced, though. In under eight months, he went from a senator, to vice president, to president, to dropping the first atomic bomb, a decision which is controversial to this day. He wasn't very popular in his day, with an average approval of around 45%. He left office with around 30% approval, which is part of the reason he decided not to run for a second term in his own right, which would have been a third term if you count the term he finished for FDR. Today, he is remembered as one of the best presidents ever. Most presidents call him near great. Others call him outright great. He places ahead of even Thomas Jefferson on many presidential ranking polls. Nowadays, his approval is somewhere near 
When Truman launched his 1948 bid for president, he was polling a little under 40%. Nobody expected him to win against Thomas Dewey of New York, and yet he did, even after the Democratic Party under him stirred the splinter and divide over civil rights. Still, he managed to pull off an upset victory that most nobody expected. He won with 57% of the electoral vote. One of the major themes of his 1948 campaign was just attacking the Republican Congress under him. But for the rest of his time as president, he had generally all right relations with Congress, and so I'll give him a six on congressional relations. Even with these generally all right relations, he wasn't able to get one of his major promises of health care through. Later, though, under LBJ, a nearly identical bill would be passed. And at the signing ceremony, Truman was honored by LBJ with starting the fight for health care. Overall, I'd say Truman was a great man, a great president. He's certainly my favorite president, and the one I look up to the most of them all, so I'll give him a 9 for how much of a role model he is, which makes for a total of 83.7 out of 120, or just about 70%. Now, for the last on this list of greats, Abe Lincoln. Lincoln was elected in 1860, and the Civil War came shortly after. The southern states, being spurred on partly by Lincoln's election and mostly by decades of broiling tension over the slavery issue, and to secession. Lincoln won in 1860 against a fractured Democratic Party, and won with a little less than 40% of the popular vote. But in 1864, when we were already in the heat of war, Lincoln almost miraculously got 55% of the popular vote and 90% of the electoral vote against the 60% he won in 1860. A few months after Lincoln's second inauguration, and only days after the war was put to an end, he was tragically shot dead. But since then, his legend and his popularity has only grown. He is often regarded as the greatest president, with over 95% of historians approving of him nowadays. And that's for good reason, too. He passed the 13th Amendment, freeing all slaves, and signed the Emancipation Proclamation before that, not to forget he won us the Civil War, with not one state having actually left the Union permanently. He had probably the hardest job of any president to save the Union, and he did it nearly perfectly. He, like Washington, Teddy, and Franklin Roosevelt, was probably the best person to have led us through the crises of his time, with empathy and unmatched leadership. We owe our country and our union, unbroken still, to him. This gives Lincoln 102.5 out of 120, which is 85.4% of the total possible points. This means Lincoln is the greatest president followed shortly by Washington, then FDR. Harry Truman and Teddy Roosevelt both tie with 70%, and then Monroe, Eisenhower, Jefferson, Coolidge, and then Garfield, placing in last place. If you've noticed the little numbers on the bottom of your screen which pop up every once in a while, those are sources which I used in the making of this video. There's a link to the full, informal list of sources in the description of this video. Actually creating that list took a good while, so let me know if it helped you at all to help me decide whether or not I should keep doing that in the future. Thank you for watching. Good night.